أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 118 of Surah At-Tawbah he says and on to the three who were left behind or who stayed behind until the earth despite its expansiveness closed in upon them and their own souls closed in upon them and they deemed there to be no refuge from God except with him then God pardoned them so that they may repent. Truly God is relenting and merciful. As you recall, brothers and sisters, many of the verses in Surah At-Tawbah are related to the military expedition of Tabuk. Now the military campaign of Tabuk revealed a lot of ugly realities about the Muslim community. Now, many of the companions of the Prophet, they would pray alongside the Prophet. They would sit in his presence when he would conduct lessons. But the, the Battle of Tabuk really was a test for the community. And we mentioned in many of the verses that we've already covered, that it was one of those battles that truly exposed the hypocritical elements within the community. You know, where there were other battles where the munafiqeen were able to conceal themselves, they were able to disguise themselves and blend in with the believers. But the Battle of Tabuk, because it was such a dangerous battle, because it was a battle that was going to be against a superpower, and there were great financial uh, risk, there, there were great financial uh, burdens. You see that many of the munafiqeen essentially exposed themselves by refusing to join. Now, it's important for us, as you'll as we'll find in this verse. There were some who remained behind, who refused to join the Prophet, not because they were hypocrites. So we understand that many of the verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many, many, in many of the verses that we've covered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala castigates, he reprimands, he threatens the hypocrites who chose to, to stay behind. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing our attention to an incident relating to three companions of the Prophet who were not hypocrites. So you have some who refused to join because of their hypocrisy, because in reality they didn't believe that the Prophet was a messenger of God. They were merely pretending to be Muslim because they saw certain advantages in identifying as Muslims. So they refused to join for obvious reasons. There was no faith there to begin with. There were certain group, there were certain Muslims, certain companions who didn't join, not because of hypocrisy, but because of laziness, because of negligence. And in particular, there were three companions who didn't join the Prophet because of their laziness, because of their worldly attachment. So these are individuals who believed that the Prophet was a messenger of God. They were not kuffar, they were not munafiqeen. They were mu'mineen who had fallen short. They made a mistake. They were lazy. They were negligent. And historians actually identify these three individuals by name. So you see that you know this became such a well-known incident that history has even documented the names of these three companions. So the first one was Ka'b Ka ibn Malik, and I'll speak about one of them in particular because there is a, you know, a, there is a historical account linked to one of them. So Ka'b ibn Malik, Marara ibn Rabi' and Hilal ibn Umayyah. So these three companions refused to join the Prophet. And Ka'b ibn Malik, in his own words, he says, 
that before the Prophet left for Tabuk, so the, the announcement is made that the Muslims have to come together, they have to head towards the, the Roman borders, and they have to fight against the, the mighty Roman army. So when the Prophet made the announcement, many, many of the companions joined. Ka'b ibn Malik was one of the ones who had no valid reason why he was staying behind. He had no logistical problem. He had the financial resources to purchase weaponry and support the Prophet. But for whatever reason, worldly attachment, fear, negligence, laziness, he stays behind. So he says, before the Prophet left for Tabuk, I was in a, in a perpetual state of indecision. So Ka'b ibn Malik, he's thinking to himself that it's, it's a long journey. You know, I have family. I'm going to be away from them for, you know, months, an extended period of time. It's... This is a this is a a military expedition that is going to be great, very costly. I, I may risk my life. You know, we're going up against a superpower. We might, we might we might be obliterated. So he's he's indecisive, and he kept on delaying the uh, you know the necessary. Uh, he he kept on putting off you know making necessary arrangements. So in any case, the prophet leaves. The munafiqeen stay behind. As we mentioned, the Prophet, in certain cases, he gave them permission to stay because he knew that the hypocrites, if they were to join the Prophet, they would have created a lot of internal problems. They would have lowered the morale of the, the Muslim army. So the Prophet gives, gives some of them permission to stay. Some of them don't even bother asking the, the Prophet for, for permission to stay. They just, you know... Uh, they uh, just they stay behind. They were insolent. They were defiant. And then you have these three individuals: Kaab ibn Malik, Marara ibn Rabi, and Hilal ibn Umayyah, who stay behind for no good reason. They're mu'minin, but they fail in supporting the Prophet. So Rasulullah sets out. The battle actually never takes place. They come back to Medina. When the Prophet returns to Medina, these three individuals were remorseful. Ka'b ibn Malik, Marara, and, and Hilal. They basically come to the Prophet and ask him for forgiveness. They apologize to the Prophet. Now, interestingly, the Prophet ﷺ, he shuns them. He basically says he doesn't he doesn't tell them that they're forgiven or they're pardoned or, you know, it's okay, it's no big deal. The Prophet says, I will leave your judgment to God. I have to wait for revelation to see what is the proper course of action with respect to you. So the Prophet refuses to speak to them. In fact, he also commands, he instructs the entire Ummah, the Muslim community, to boycott them. So. You know, so they come and they, they apologize. The Prophet refuses to speak to them. And he instructs everybody in the community to shun them, to, to socially boycott them. Now, you can imagine how, how difficult that is, that the Prophet and, and many of the companions, they, they took these, uh, you know, this, they took this social boycott very seriously. So... Two of the men, they were so embarrassed and humiliated that the Prophet had shunned them and refused to speak to them, that they stay in their homes. They were so humiliated that they did not even come out in public. Ka'b ibn Malik, who was one of the three, he was the only one who had you know, the, the fortitude or the courage to come out and walk in the marketplace. And he would come to the masjid and he would pray with the Muslims, but he himself, he says, he describes, you know, that period where he was boycotted. He says that I would go to the marketplace and no one would sell me anything. No one would speak to me. And when he would go to the masjid, yes, he would pray, but no one would interact with him. They, they literally acted as though he didn't exist. 
And even their wives, even their children, they came to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, what should we do? The Prophet says, don't leave your husbands, but don't speak to them. It, it became this, this severe. Now the Quran says, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى So as for those who, the ones who stayed behind, who refused to join the Prophet, the three, the three individuals that I mentioned, the social boycott became so intense that Allah describes it as حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضِ That even though the earth is expansive and the city of Medina is a big city, the city felt like it was shrinking in on them. They felt as if they had nowhere to go. Two of them, they basically decided not to leave their homes. Ka'ab ibn Malik is walking around and he feels as if he has nowhere to go. They were. This was how much pressure was put on them. Hatta idha waqat alayhim ul ardu bima rahubat wa waqat alayhim anfusuhum. Not only did the city seem to shrink because they had nowhere to turn, nowhere to go, they also felt that their souls and their hearts were becoming constricted. You know, they felt this intense loneliness. The, the remorse started to eat away at them. They came to the realization that there is no refuge from God except through him that they have no they have nowhere to go the only solution is to turn to God and to ask him for repentance now this social boycott it didn't just last for a few hours or a few days some narrations say that after 50 days Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardoned them they were literally roaming and they went into the outskirts of Medina and they were begging God for his forgiveness. Now you may ask me, why didn't Allah just forgive them on day one? It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to understand the, the gravity of the sin that they committed. That if Allah were to just have forgiven them without making them go through this period of self-examination, they would have taken that sin lightly. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after 50 days, after 50 days, when the entire community boycotted them, after 50 days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons them. Now, there's an important lesson here for us, brothers and sisters. You know, unfortunately, in many communities, we often allow politeness to override our moral duty. Now, there are certain sins that people commit in private. You know, so you discover that someone drinks or someone, you know, commits certain sins in private. Now, such a person, you don't need to socially boycott them. You can advise them privately, you know, encourage them to kind of abandon that way of life. But when a sin is committed publicly, so we're talking about fisk, someone who's fasik. Someone who's fasik is someone who's openly committing a sin. The community has a responsibility. The community has a see. See, Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi an al Munkar in joining good and forbidding evil is not just an individual responsibility. Forbidding evil has to also happen at a communal level, and this is exactly what the Prophet established. This is this is the type of culture the Prophet created. That when people commit sins publicly and failing to join the Prophet in jihad was a public sin. And therefore, it, it warranted a social boycott. And you see that this social boycott, according to this verse, reaped a very positive outcome. It led to individual reform. Now, when people commit sin, you know, when people in our community, they commit sins publicly, we as a community, as a community, we have to express disappointment. As a community, we have to express and convey disapproval. 
I'll give you a very simple example. Imagine in our community, and this happens all the time, someone in the community has a wedding. And subhanAllah, when people have weddings, it's as though halal has become haram and haram has become halal. No, no one pays attention to the rulings of Islam anymore. It's as if on, on, on our wedding day, you know, the malaika, they just turn a blind eye. The sharia doesn't apply on the, it's a, it's a satanic Eid, right? It's a day where, you know, we are not bound by the law of God. So when wedding celebrations take place, and you might have someone in the community, it might even be a relative. They invite a singer. They they allow, you know, you know, you know, mingling and flirtation, and there could be dancing and women removing their hijab. This is this you're facilitating, you know, a venue, you're facilitating an event where people are sitting publicly. What would happen if we as a community just didn't show up to those types of weddings? And we shunned people that did that. This, this is what our responsibility is. But the problem is, you know, we don't say anything because we don't want to offend. We don't want to be confrontational. But here the prophet, this verse is really speaking about the importance of of nahi anil munkar at a societal level. You know, sometimes people ask me, and it reminded me of, uh, uh, you know, these these questions, you know, reminded me of, uh, of this verse. You know, people often ask that, Sheikh, there's this new halal restaurant. They have the best halal food. The owner is a Muslim, but he sells alcohol. Are we allowed to go? Now, as, forget about whether the, the meat is halal or not. That's not the issue. The, the greater issue is that this is a Muslim who is selling alcohol. He's committing a public sin. He's fasiq. He's publicly sinning. You as a Muslim, you have a duty to never step foot in his restaurant. But what do we do? We say, no, no, he has, he has you know, good halal food. Let's just go. Now, the food might be halal. But you're committing another sin, and that is that you're, you're failing in your responsibility to express this, this disapproval that as a community. So if there is a Muslim who opens up a restaurant and he offers halal food, but he sells alcohol, no Muslim should step foot in his, his restaurant. That is the type of pressure that has to be put on people who have the audacity to commit sins publicly. So even though this verse is speaking about three individuals who failed to join the Prophet in the battle of Tabuk, that this ayah has very practical applications today. You know, now as I said, you know, when people are committing sins privately and it's not it's not public, it's not known, then there's a, there's another course of action. But if if haram weddings are taking place, if if certain res Muslim-owned restaurants are selling alcohol, that we have to kind of revive this 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 tradition of, you know, if you're going to publicly sin, you're not going to have the support of the community. That you, you should expect to be, uh, you should expect to be condemned. You should expect that. The Muslims are not are going to shun you. That you you are going to be socially boycotted. You know the problem is you know we we boycott products that are, for example, manufactured in Israel, which is good. We should, but we should also boycott people who are publicly sinning, because you might be held responsible in the eyes of God for kind of you know being lenient and turning a blind eye when it comes to these issues. You know nehi an al munkar forbidding evil is one of the most abandoned obligations you know many people they pray they fast they go to hajj but when it comes to this issue you know they, they don't want to be confrontational they don't want to lose friends right because if you're going to be like this if you're going to start calling people out if you're going to start you know 
removing yourself, if you're going to start ending relationships, you know, people are going to ask, you know, who am I going to hang out with? What's going to happen to these relationships? And this is precisely why Allah in the next verse, verse 119, it's as though Allah is answering, you know, a, uh, a question that might cross your mind. And that is that if, if we're going to socially boycott people who are publicly sinning, you know, you know what, what, what relationships am I going to have left? What does Allah say? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, ittaqullaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. O you who believe, be conscious of God. So the, the basis of any relationship you have should be, it should revolve around taqwa, God consciousness. Be conscious of God and be with, be with the truthful ones. You don't need to, you don't need to be friends with everybody. You don't need to be on good terms with everybody. It's okay to, to cut people off. It's okay to disassociate yourselves from people who do not respect the law of God. You're not, you're not obligated to befriend everybody. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amru, attaqullah. One of the manifestations of taqwa, you know, taqwa is not just an abstract idea. One of the ways in which we practice taqwa is that we are careful about who we associate with. وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ And be with the truthful. Now, who are the truthful? Now, some of the mufassireen of the Qur'an they have a lengthy discussion regarding, you know, who are the truthful ones? A sadiqin doesn't mean just someone who's honest. Because what is the definition of someone who is sadiq? At the very least, someone who is sadiq is someone who, whose actions are a reflection of their words. There's authenticity between their words and their actions. That's one, one of the meanings of sadiq. There are many ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt السلام, that actually say that be with the truthful, the, the highest example of the truthful are the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. You know, so if there's any relationship that you should be very, very cautious about, that you should really, really, you know, that you should be uncompromising about. It's your relationship with the Ahlul Bayt. Every other relationship should be conditional. There's a beautiful hadith where Sulaim ibn Qais, who was one of the uh, one of the tabi'een, and he he compiled narrations and uh, and statements. And his book, the book of Sulaim ibn Qais, is actually the the oldest historical account of what happened during the time of the Prophet and the in the in the days following the uh, the death of the Prophet. So Sulaim ibn Qais is a very renowned personality and he quotes Amir al-Mu'minin. He, so he's, he's one of the tabi'een and he says that during the the during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, as you know when Umar ibn al-Khattab was approaching the end of his life, there was a lot of pressure on him to, to appoint the third Khalifa. Now, he decides to, to establish a council, a shura of six companions of the Prophet. And amongst themselves, they, were, they are to choose who the third Khalifa will be. Now, at that meeting, you know, you have you have Ali ibn Abi Talib there. You have Uthman, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Talha Zubair. So you have these individuals there at this this closed meeting, and when they were at, at that meeting, everyone is you know essentially essentially trying to make the case for why they are more qualified to be the Khalifa. You know, so everybody's basically putting forth their arguments, supporting one person, supporting the other. In that meeting, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he stands and he says to them, the people who were in the shura, he says, 
I ask you in the name of God, who's speaking? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's addressing the members of the Shura. Don't you know? Are you not aware that God revealed this verse, which is verse 119 of Surah At-Tawbah? Ya amanu, ya wa kunu O you who believe, be conscious of God and be with the truthful. Imam Amir al muminin he says that when this verse was revealed, and all of them, they trusted the Qur'anic knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the Imam is telling them about sababun nuzul. Why he, he, he's speaking to uh, them about this verse and a conversation that happened between Salman al-Farisi and the Prophet. So when this verse was revealed, qala Salman, Salman al-Farisi, he asks the Prophet, Ya Rasulallah, a'ammatun hiya am khassa? That is this verse, when Allah tells the believers to be with the truthful, the truthful ones, is Allah speaking about truthful people in general? You know, so for example, if I go to work and I find a non-Muslim who's very truthful, who's honest, you know, there are many non-Muslims who don't lie. They're very honest people. Is Allah telling us to be with them, to be with Sadiqeen in that sense? So Salman is saying, Sadiqeen, is Allah referring to, you know, the truthful ones in general? Or is Allah speaking about a very specific category of truthful people? The Prophet, he says, he explains the meaning of this ayah. The Prophet says, as for the ones who are being commanded, meaning when Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena aminu, O you who believe, the Prophet says that is general. So when Allah says, O you who believe, he is addressing the mu'min, the Muslim, male, female, the elders, the younger ones. So, Ya ayyuhalladheena aminu, O you who believe, God is addr addressing the general Muslim community, the general population of believers. So, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا It refers to the believers in general. And then the Prophet says, وَأَمَّا الصَّادِقُونَ As for the truthful ones, فَخَاصَ That is specific. Allah is not just talking about be with truthful people. That's not what it means. It's speaking about a very specific category of truthful people. Who are they? The Prophet says to Salman, وَأَمَّا الصَّادِقُونَ فَخَاصَّةٌ لِأَخِي عَلِي وَالْأَوْصِيَاءَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ The truthful ones are my brother Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, of course, here brother doesn't mean biological brother, my, 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 uh, my spiritual brother. Ali and his descendants until the Day of Judgment. So in any period, so during the time of the Prophet, being with the truthful ones means be with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Don't worry about losing friends, losing other people. As long as you're with Ali, you're in good shape. During the time of Imam al-Hassan, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, taqullaha wa kunu ma'assadqin. Be God conscious and be with the believers, meaning be with Imam al-Hassan. Don't worry too much about all of the other friendships that you're going to lose. As long as you're with this truthful individual, you are a person of taqwa. So in every generation, the believers are asked, they're commanded to be with the truthful ones. And the truthful ones are the ma'sumin in every period. So in, in our time, being with the truthful ones is to be with the 12th Imam. But you may ask me, the Imam is in Ghayb, how can we be with him? One of the ways that you can be with the Imam, of course, is you know you fulfill your wajibat, avoid the muharramat, but in many ways that being with the 12th Imam means that you obey him. And during his Ghaybah, he has asked you and I to refer to the ulama. So being with the institution of Marji'iyah, for example, 
is one of the ways in which we practice wakunu ma'asadiqin. Because the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, back, going back to the time of Imam Sadiq they established an institution whereby they wanted the believers to refer to scholars who have knowledge and piety. Knowledge and piety in every generation. That's why people, they used to come to Imam Ar-Ridha and they would say to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, you know, we live far away from you. We cannot come to Medina whenever we have a question. So who should we take our religion from? He says, go to Zakariya ibn Adam. Take your deen from him. Why? Because he's a person of knowledge and a person of taqwa. So this idea of referring to pious scholars was, was, uh, was mentioned by all of the Imams of Ahl So in the time of Ghaybah, وَكُونُ مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ One of the ways in which we are with the 12th Imam is to be with the institution that they have they established to protect us from misguidance. The institution of referring to pious, knowledgeable scholars. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 120, He says, مَا كَانَ لِأَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ وَمَنْ حَوْلَهُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ أَنْ يَتَخَلَّفُوا عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَرْغَبُوا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ لَا يُصِيبُهُمْ ضَمَأٌ وَلَا نَصَبٌ وَلَا مَخْنَصَةٌ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَطَعُونَ مَوْطِئًا يَغِيضُ الْكُفَّارِ وَلَا يَنَالُونَ مِنْ عَدُوِّ النَّيْلَ إِلَّا كُتِبَ لَهُمْ بِهِ عَمَلٌ صَالِحٌ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah says, it is not for the people of Medina and the Bedouin who dwell around them to remain behind from the Messenger of God or to prefer themselves to Him. That is because no thirst, nor toil, nor hunger befalls them in the way of God, nor do they take any step in raging the disbelievers, nor do they endure anything at the hands of an enemy, but that a righteous deed is recorded for them on account of it. Truly God does not neglect the reward of the virtuous. This is a very, very interesting verse because when you look at the Prophet's life, the Prophet ﷺ issued religious commands. He told Muslims how to pray, how to fast, how to perform hajj, how much zakat and khumus to pay, and so on and so forth. The Sahaba generally, they were very obedient when it came to the Prophet's religious commands. However, when it came to political commands when it came to political orders some of them they exercise their own own judgment so it's almost as though they created this this false uh, this false dichotomy that you know there are religious commands and there are political commands religious commands will obey the prophet but political orders, you know, we can we can give our input. We don't necessarily have to obey the prophet. So when the prophet tells us how, how many rak'ah to pray, we'll, we'll obey. When he tells us we have to march towards Tabuk, because that's a political order, they would take it more lightly, as though it, did, it does not have the same authority. It doesn't have the same weight. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells the, the people of Medina, the Arab, the companions, that it is not for the people of Medina and the Bedouins who dwell around them to remain behind from the Messenger of God. That you, you have to obey the Prophet even when it comes to political orders. That even his political orders are divinely sanctioned. Or to prefer themselves to him. You know, many of these companions, they wanted to stay behind because they feared for their lives. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying to them that don't desire your your own life. Do not give preference to your life over the life of the Prophet. Don't, don't say that I'm not going to join the Prophet because it's dangerous. If the Prophet is going, why your safety does not have priority over the Prophet's safety. So the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believers, telling the companions that do not desire your life. Do not value your life, your security over the Prophet. That you need to you need to love him more than you love yourself. You need to be willing to sacrifice yourself before he sacrifices. And this is you know when, when you look at the statements of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the Imam, he speaks about the type of love that he had for the Prophet and the type of love that some of the companions had for the Prophet. So the Imam alayhi salam, he says that we loved him, we loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, more than we loved ourselves. We, lo we, 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 we preferred him over ourselves. And the Imam says, even more than that, we loved him more than we loved our fathers and mothers. The Imam السلام, he says, we loved the Prophet more than ourselves. We loved him even more than our parents, our mothers and fathers. And we loved him even more than a thirsty person loves cold water. That's how we felt about the Messenger of God. And there were some of the companions who had that type of attitude. Of course, Ali ibn Abi Talib, you know, I mean, Ali ibn Abi Talib, we shouldn't even, you know, call him a companion. He's the nafs of the Prophet. But people like Salman, Naqdad, Abu Dhar, you know, they say that even when the Prophet used to do wudu, when he would pour water and do wudu, some of the companions of the Prophet loved him so much that they would fight just to collect the droplets of water that would fall from his arms and face. They would want to capture the drops of water. So this is, this is the spirit of, of faith, that believers have to prefer the prophet over themselves. You see, with, with the battle of, so with the battle of, uh, of Tabuk, because the battle never took place, you find that many of the companions, they were disenchanted, they were frustrated. Because if you look at the Battle of Badr, for example, the Battle of, the battle of Badr offered spiritual rewards and material rewards. So those who fought in Badr, they gained the thawab, of fighting, they, they joined the Prophet, and they also gained spoils of war. So Badr, spiritual reward, material reward. Uhud, same thing. The other battles, they were, they were always spoils of war. The Battle of Khaybar, for example. So in every battle, there, there's this combination of spiritual reward and material reward. The Battle of Tabuk, there was no material reward. There were no spoils of war. They went on this long journey. They endured hunger, thirst. They went through all of these hardships, and they come back empty-handed. So they do something for the sake of Allah, and they come back empty-handed. Some of them were bothered by this. They thought that, man, this was a complete waste of time, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he reminds them that when you do things for my sake, don't think about, you know, the material, the, uh, the material uh, gifts. Don't think about the outcomes so much. So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, no thirst, no toil, no hunger that befalls you is, is going to go without reward and this is a lesson for us you know sometimes we do something for the sake of Allah and we don't achieve our desired goal 
you know, this is the case with some of the companions in Tabuk, they go and they didn't achieve at least part of the goal that they were looking for. You know, sometimes you and I, when we do something for the sake of Allah, you know, you know, you establish an organization, you you volunteer in the community, and you have a certain goal that you want to achieve, and you don't meet your goal. Allah says, don't think that it's a failure. Don't think that it's a failure because of the struggle, if your intentions were right, even if you don't achieve the desired outcome, those long hours, you know, all of that gas that you spent, all of the, the heartache, that is not going to go unaccounted for. All of that is going to be recorded. And I think this is a very important verse for those who are interested in community work. You know, in many cases, every project is going to feel like tabuk. It's a long, arduous journey, and you don't really gain anything that's tangible. But Allah says, you know, I don't, the, God does not neglect the reward of the virtuous. You know, so, you know, the, the slogan, the mantra of people who work and do Islamic work should be, in Allah la yudli'u ajr al Muhsineen, that Allah does not neglect the reward of the virtuous. You're probably not going to get the credit that you deserve if you, you know, if you work in our communities. In fact, not only will you not get credit, you're probably going to be attacked. But you're not you're not doing it for praise. You're not doing it for accolades. In Allah, la yudli'u ajr al muhsineen. God does not neglect, he does not waste the efforts. Of the virtuous. So these companions that felt that tabuk was a waste of time, Allah says, don't think about it like that. You struggled for my sake. That in and of itself has its thawab. Irrespective of you know the the tangible outcomes that you were looking for. And then Allah in verse 121, He says, وَلَا يُنفِقُونَ نَفَقَةً صَغِيرَةً Allah says, continuing the discussion, nor do they spend anything, be it small or large, nor traverse a valley, but that it is written down for them that God may record for them, record them for the best of that which they used to do. Now, it, when when the the companions went set out for Tabuk, as I said, some of them had to spend a lot of their own money. You know, some some of them maybe had to purchase a sword. One guy maybe had to purchase a shield. Some of them had to actually purchase horses or camels. I mean, you're talking about a lot of money. So some of them spent a lot of money. Some of them spent a small amount. Allah says. Nothing that you spend, whether it's a large amount of money or a small amount of money, even the energy that you expend it, you, you're, you're, you're traveling through these deserts into the valleys. Allah says, I, I know about all of that. It's not wasted. When you're working for Allah, there is no such thing as wasted effort. So Allah says, I take account of all of this. And not only Am I recording it? Not only is it being recorded, when it comes to rewarding you for it. So it's one thing that Allah is saying, I, I know I know about your effort. Allah says, لِيَجْزِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنَ مَا كَانُوا يعني. You know, there are, there are two ways of understanding this last uh, passage. So one possible meaning is that Allah will reward you Better than your deeds, meaning that your deeds are good, but the reward that you will be given is greater than what the deed actually deserves. That what, what Allah will give you is better, is greater than what you deserve from that action. That's one uh, explanation that's given. Other Mufassirin, they say, no, the meaning of is that when Allah rewards you in the Akhirah, when He decides to reward you for what you did, 
he's not gonna he's not gonna reward you based on the mediocre things that you did. That when he rewards you, he will be rewarding you by looking at the best of what you did. So when Allah rewards you for your prayer, for example, he's not gonna pick the Fajr prayer when you were completely exhausted and you you did it with no hulur al qalb. When Allah rewards you for your salah, He's going to pick out the best prayers that you offer. When it comes to, you know, to, to any good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you based on the best actions that you did. Because He's kareem, because He's generous, because He's merciful. And then ayah number 122, Allah says, And then ayah number 122, But it is not for the believers all to go forth. And why should not a party from each group go forth to gain a deep understanding of religion and to warn people when they return to them so that they will be cautious. Now, if you look at all of the verses that we've covered so far relating to the, the Battle of Tabuk and the, 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 the divine threats against those who you know, defied the Prophet and stayed behind, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the incident of those who made tawbah and Allah, you know, waited 50 days to pardon them. So because of this history where Allah and the Prophet castigate those who don't participate in jihad, what happened afterwards is that when the Prophet called people to go and fight, everyone would go because they, they would be afraid that verses of the Quran would be revealed about them. So there was this new there was this new problem that emerged. So before people were too lazy to go and join the prophet. After these verses are revealed condemning and exposing the munafiqeen and some of the believers for not joining the prophet, suddenly everyone wants to go to the battlefield. Now here Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says it is not for the believers all to go forth. It's not smart, it's not wise, that the mu'mineen shouldn't all go. There's a certain group from among the believers who might be able-bodied, who might have otherwise been required to go fight in jihad, but there is now a new group that is exempt from jihad. So you have women, children, the elderly, the sick, they're exempt, but there's a new group that's exempt. Who is this group? They are a group who are to dedicate their lives and their time to gaining a deep understanding of Islam. But it is not for the believers all to go forth. That it's that the meaning shouldn't all go to the battlefield. And why should not a party from each group? So during the time of the Prophet, you have many different tribes surrounding Medina, even within, within Medina. So here the Quran is saying that from each group, from each tribe, from each clan, from each village, there needs to be a group of people, a small group, Ta'ifa, who dedicate their lives to the pursuit of religious knowledge. Now, tafaqqa comes from the word fiqh. Now, here, fiqh doesn't mean just, you know, ahkam, halal and haram. Tafaqqa fiddin, it means to have a deep understanding of Islam. Not, not just the basics. It's not enough to know the basics. So you, there needs to be a group of people who, who are ulama. Who are true scholars, they have a deep understanding of the religion. 
So these individuals are to stay. So for example, the, the Prophet didn't always participate in, in battles. So just so you guys are familiar with some terms, when you see the word ghazwa, you know, or maghazi, which is the plural, or ghazawat, those are the, the battles that were led by the Prophet. So for example, ghazwat tabuk. Ghazwat tabuk. Why is it called Ghazwat Tabuk? Because the Prophet was there. He was a participant. He was leading the army. You know, Badr, Uhud, these are all Ghazawat. You know, there, there are books written on the Maghazi of the Prophet, the battles of the Prophet. And there's the word Sariya. Sariya is a military brigade where the Prophet would dispatch an army, but he, he wasn't leading the army. This is called Sariya. Now, there were many occasions, so there were 83 battles fought during the time of the Prophet. Many of them, they were saraya. They were, the Prophet didn't participate. He stayed behind. Now, even the battles that were not led by the Prophet, everyone wanted to join. Because again, there was this fear of being exposed and castigated. Now, this verse is revealed saying that some of a group of you from each tribe, from each village, needs to stay behind and stay with the Prophet so he teaches you Islam. So you develop a deep understanding of your faith and then you go back to your communities and you teach them. This, brothers and sisters, is a very, very important verse because... You know, it's it's the verse that I share with communities that I visit, you know, especially when they when they say that, you know, Sheikh, we don't have a resident alim. What should we do? The problem is the reason why most Islamic centers and masajid they don't have resident scholars is because they didn't plan for it. You know, you want to import scholars from the Middle East or other parts of the world. The Qur'an is telling you that what you should do is that someone from among you فَلَوْلَا مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٍ That there should be a group from among you who go لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ So instead of importing scholars, we have to export potential scholars so they can come back because they know the challenges of the community. So having scholars in our community, training people, investing in people to become scholars, this is wajib kifai. But no, no one seems to take this problem seriously. We're good at building mosques and building centers, but we don't have any plan for who's going to run the mosque. You know, it's like building hospitals, but there's no, there's no system to educate doctors. You know, we keep on building masajid with no ulama. It's like building hospitals with no doctors. The solution is what? The solution is that we as a community, we have to understand that in the same way that every society needs doctors and lawyers and engineers, every society, every community needs ulama. That they have to go, لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدين. And after they study, they come back, and they serve the community. The problem is we don't, and, and this has to be done in every generation. You know, even if even for the communities that have a resident scholar, you have to you have to think about succession planning. You know, it's it's amazing to me that year after year, you know, we celebrate the event of Eid al ghadir You know, one of the most important take-home messages of Eid al ghadir is succession planning. Now the Prophet did that with Ali ibn Abi Talib. We need to do that at an organizational level. And one of the ways that we do it is, is by following this verse. فَلَوْلَا مِن كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذِرُونَ Now let me end just with uh, a few, a couple of ahadith that I think... Uh, really shed light on the importance of investing in in future scholars there's a hadith from imam ja'far as-sadiq salawatullahi alayhi where he says sari'u ila talab al-ilm 
hasten towards the seeking of knowledge. Sariru. So the Imam, it's almost like there's a sense of urgency. I swear by the one who has my soul in his hand. He swears by Allah. Lahadithun wahidun fi halalin wa haram ta'khuduhu min sadiq khayrun min ad dunya wa ma hamalat min dhahabin wa filta. That listening to one hadith. One hadith about what God permits and what God forbids. Just getting that knowledge. Something as simple as one mas'ala. Learning something new about what God forbids and what he allows. Imam al-Sadiq, min Sadiq, that you, you receive this from a truthful person, a reliable person. خَيْرُ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا حَمَلَتْ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ وَفِلْضًا Imagine the dunya was full of gold and silver. Imam al-Sadiq says, the benefit that you derive from learning one mas'ala, which brings you closer to God, is better, has more value, even though we might not realize it. It has more value than the earth if it was filled with gold and silver. In another, in another hadith we have from... From Amir al Mu'minin, where he says, Ayyuhan Nas, Ya'lamu anna kamal ad deen talabu al ilm wal amalu bi. Oh, people know that the perfection of religion lies in seeking knowledge and acting on that knowledge. Wa anna talab al ilm awjabu alaykum min talab al mal. This last part of the hadith is, is, is where we really fail as a community. The Imam says, the obligation of seeking knowledge, here seeking religious Islamic knowledge, the obligation of seeking knowledge is even more than, it's more intense than the obligation of seeking wealth. Now you have a responsibility, for example, of providing your, for your family. It's wajib to maintain your family. It's also wajib to seek religious knowledge. So they're both wajib. So if you were to ask me, what has even more priority? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, talab al-ilm has even more priority than seeking, seeking wealth. So if you had a choice between increasing your knowledge of Islam and increasing your income, you should give priority to increasing your knowledge. So for example, I'll give you a very practical example. Imagine every Saturday you dedicate the entire you, you dedicate a few hours every Saturday to reading and, and uh, gaining religious knowledge. And then you get a job offer, a job that pays you ten thousand dollars more a year, but you have to work Saturdays. So now you have to make a choice. Do I take the job and and not study on Saturdays anymore. If taking that job that's going to give you a $10,000 raise every year, a $10,000 increase in your salary, or sticking to your older job but maintaining that religious program that you've set for yourself, Amir al says stick with the less, the lower salary, but at least have a time during the week where you pursue knowledge. And one, one final hadith and we'll conclude. The hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Uffin li kulli muslimin la yaj'alu fi kulli jumu'a yawman yatafaqahu fihi amra deenihi wa yas'alu an deen. The Prophet, he says, Woe be to the one, meaning the Prophet is, is condemning such a person. Woe be to the one who does not dedicate one day out of the week for deepening their understanding of Islam or asking about matters related to their religion. So the Prophet he's saying that as an at a minimum, at a bare minimum, Rasulullah says one day out of the week, you should dedicate it to talabul ilm. You five, six days you're running after the dunya. 
Well, just one day, Rasulullah, dedicate one day to increasing your knowledge. And the Prophet says, Uffin, woe be unto the per those who don't at least dedicate one day out of the week to increasing and deepening their knowledge of Islam. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among the seekers of knowledge and those who practice what they have learned. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. Alright, so uh, there's a few questions related to um, the halal and haram. Yeah. So uh, there's one question: um, Is it okay to eat at restaurants that are owned by non-Muslims that sell halal food? Now. If you have doubt about whether something is, is hal whether meat is halal or haram, there are three, there are three ways, there are three indicators that you can use to assume that it is halal. So for example, the first is Yadul Muslim. If a Muslim serves you meat, you're not required to ask. You can assume that the meat is halal. Yadul Muslim, so from the hand of a Muslim. Number two, Suq al Muslimin. Say there's a, a market, you know, a, a market district. You go, it's, it's it's predominantly Muslim shops. You go to that area, the meat that you consume in that area, you can assume that it's halal. You're not required to ask. Suq al Muslimin. Baladul Muslimin. If you're in a Muslim country, a predominantly Muslim country, and you have doubts, you're not sure if this meat is haram or halal, because you're in a predominantly Muslim country, you can assume that it is halal to eat. Now, of course, if you know, if you have a ilm, if you're, you, if you're certain that something is forbidden, then you, obviously you act on your knowledge. Now, if a Muslim tells, if a non-Muslim tells you that this is halal, you, that's, not, that's not sufficient. So the, the, the restaurant would have to be owned by someone uh, someone who's Muslim because the statement of a, of a non-Muslim in this regard is not a hujjah. Uh, also, you talked about uh, that it's okay, you should be uh, cutting off people or cu it's okay to cut off people if they openly sin. Uh, how does this apply to uh, close family members who haven't, who might not comply with certain Islamic laws, such as riba? Now, now when it comes to to cutting, so so if, even if we go back to the the uh, the incident where those three individuals were boycotted, their wives and their children, they asked, "Should we just come, leave them?" The Prophet says, "No, because." You have, you have, when it comes to family, especially direct family, even relatives, you have an obligation of salatul rahim. You have to maintain ties with your kin. Now, if you have a family member or a relative who's openly sinning, you don't cut ties with them, but at the same time, you don't need to be like lovey dovey with them. You have to express some level of disapproval. So if I have a cousin or a sibling who's committing haram openly, I'm not allowed to sever ties with them because, because of their fist, because they're openly sinning. I have to maintain ties with them. But when I do interact with them, you know, you can be cordial, but at the same time, you have to make it known that, listen, what you're doing is completely wrong. They want it, they think that you're annoying, this and that. That doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you have you have a religious obligation of expressing your discontent. If you need to distance yourself a little bit. As a way of showing your disapproval, that's fine. But to completely cut off ties, you're not allowed to do that when it comes to uh, and uh, family and, uh, and relatives. And uh, in certain situations where boycotts may not seem like they would be useful, such as if it's just a small number of boycotts or boycotters or the communal boycott might not impact the person, do you have any thoughts on what may be alternative ways of expressing disapproval? The, the reason why I think that people automatically assume that that might not work is because I, I haven't seen 
a community that really practices that consistently. You know, I, I think because we've failed to forbid evil, to stand up against corruption at a community level, when anyone does it, it's, it comes off as very foreign and aggressive and unreasonable. It's because we've, we've, we've chosen, you know, politeness and non-confrontation just, you know, for the sake of keeping the peace. And in many cases, we, we've compromised a lot of our Islamic values. You know, there are certain weddings that happen. People go because they feel pressured. They go out of obligation. That's, that's very problematic. Now, let's assume that, you know, so, socially boycotting someone doesn't work. Let's assume that it doesn't work. Our job is not to ensure that oh, it's gonna work or it doesn't work. We, we have an obligation of speaking out again. So for example, if someone holds a wedding and they bring a singer and there's dancing, now you can, you can approach them privately, that's fine. But to continue having a relationship with someone who's openly sinning like that and act as though nothing's wrong, that's, that's, that's problematic. So, if, if they don't change or if it's not effective, that's on them. Allah is not going to hold you accountable because, oh, your social boycott didn't work. The effect that it has on them, that's between them and Allah. But our obligation as a community is that we have to have a very firm stand when it comes to these things. I think that if we created this type of positive pressure, do you think, do you think Muslims would have the audacity to, to sell alcohol and sell halal meat? You know, at the restaurant, if, if it didn't create such an uproar, the, the, re the reason is it doesn't create an uproar. And, you know, few people here and there might make a big deal, but by and large, people are going to go to the restaurant and they're going to act like this, this Muslim is not doing anything wrong. Oh, he's selling alcohol. It's between him and Allah. No, it's not between him and Allah. It's, it's, this is, this is a, this is a, this is a violation of this, of the community. You know, so the, the community has a responsibility of, uh, of stepping up and saying that, listen, if you don't stop selling alcohol, we're not going to come to your restaurant. In fact, we will actively tell people not to come to your restaurant. Is that going to create, you know, conflict and a bit of drama? Yes. But, you know, what's, what's worse is staying silent and having a community where, it's okay. People don't are not. They don't even bat an eyelash that a Muslim is selling alcohol. That is more dangerous. So, you know, the, a little bit of drama here and there. That's not. What's more dangerous is is Muslims not even feeling. You know, that when you get rid of that shock value. You know, now for example, we have uh, weddings in the Muslim community. Weddings that happen between a man and a man. A gay wedding. And no one says anything. You know, in the beginning, there's a bit of an uproar. Every person in the Muslim community should boycott that wedding. Should not step foot in that wedding. But, oh, he's a relative and, you know, we have to promote this and that. that that's what happens. The, because munkar is done and everybody wants to be, you know, polite. The next time around, the shock value of having a gay Muslim wedding is going to be completely eliminated. Because we failed in... Nehi'an al munkar at a community level. So you're 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 not obligated. So whether whether it's effective or not, that's between them and Allah. How they want to react to be to being boycotted by the community, that's between them and God. We as this community, we fulfilled our our duty before God. Do you, you understand what I mean? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um... So uh, another question. Um, could you please uh, t tell us what translation and tafsir you uh, you are using? I'd like to read alongside you. So the the translation that I that I use is a uh, it's a combination of uh, of Sahih International. You can find it on the uh, online, and also uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasr's uh, the study of Quran. I use that his uh, his translation. And, and sometimes, uh, so it's a combination of, of the two. Sometimes I don't like the way Sahih International translates a word. And sometimes I don't like the way that Sayyid Hussein Nasr translates a word. So, you know, between those two, I kind of, uh, I, uh, I use both of them and try to come up with the most 
what I believe to be the most accurate a translation of the verse. Oh, uh, and just and uh, who who is the Sahih translation by? So it, it's 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 called Sahih International. I, I go to this website called uh, uh, let me pull it up uh, Corpus dot quran dot com and it has basically different translations and one of them is called sahih international i don't i don't know what that is but it's uh it's one of the translations that's given and it seems to be pretty good and um and is there any resource that tells the context of each battles during and after the prophet's life uh, I would like to know the positions of the imams and the expansion of the empire through con con uh, conquest. Sorry. So a, a book on the uh, on the conquest of the uh, the prophet. Uh, I think the questions about conquest of both the prophet and like the khalifas afterwards, or not just the khalifas, but yeah, the different caliphs afterwards, so that the person's asking to understand how, what the imams were doing during the expansion. In English or in uh, which language? Um, presumably English, but I, this is an online question. Yeah, I mean, in in English, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not re I'm not really familiar with uh, with with English uh, books. There's a book called El Maghazi, but that's that's about the the prophets, uh, you know, uh, conquests and military campaigns. In Arabic, what would be one that also that, that also covers? Uh, the uh, the conquest of the Khulafa. Off the top of my head, I'm not I'm not really sure. I have to I would have to check. If you can remind me, uh, Zain Allah, I'll try to try to find a, a good resource for that. But it's probably going to be in Arabic, so I'm not sure I'm not sure if that's going to be useful in English. I I really don't know. All right, I'll try to remind you, Inshallah. At least we can get a. This is this is why we need we need more scholars from each community that can go and kind of specialize. In these, in these different fields, inshallah. Inshallah. And a follow-up question to the previous discussion. Uh, wouldn't boycotting people in Western societies push them away from religion? Because uh, most people aren't very religious to begin with in the West. So... It's a good question. I mean, I I would presume that if if someone is uh, is not religious, and uh, and you completely boycott them because they committed a sin, in uh, and, and when we say you know when someone commits a sin in public, you know we're we're not we're not talking about someone who's ignorant and they didn't know. Someone who knows and is just being rebellious and is doing uh, out of defiance. You know, could it push someone away from uh, from uh, from Islam? It's possible, and I understand. You know where where the questioner is coming from, because I mean that that's the impression that that I would get. But you know, if if you approach such a person privately and you try to advise them, and they still don't listen, what what option are are you are you left with? You know, if if you if you just interact with them with kindness and you're just nice about it you're you're essentially promoting that type of uh that that type of behavior so you 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 really have to use your judgment but but I think that you know because when when people sin publicly it's it's such a danger that Islam takes a very strong stand against it and in fact you know if this was you know, if, if we were living during the time of the Prophet, these people, such people, would actually be subject to uh, to punishment. They they would they would be in, in many cases they would be physically punished. You know, for uh, for selling alcohol, for for doing some of these sins publicly. This is what the Prophet would uh, would do. That's what he would have done in in uh, at that time. How he would have dealt with it at this time, I would assume that it's it's similar. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows the best. But so if if you believe that you know this, it's going to push them further away from Islam. Again, you know we're not we're not responsible for the way that people react when we're fulfilling our our obligations. Now, when I when I say shun people, 
I don't mean like verbally abuse them. I just mean that, you know, if, if you, you're not, you're, you don't go to their restaurant, for example. When you meet them, you make it an issue to bring it up to them and in a respectful way, but, but you, you, you take a stand. You know, in the same way that, you know, Musa speaks to Fir'aun. You know, he's assertive, but he's, he's respectful. So when I say shun them, I don't mean like, you know, you, you verbally abuse them or you, I mean that you bring up the issue, you're assertive, you're firm, but you're also respectful. I don't, I don't think that, I don't think you need to be harsh or rude, but at the same time, you, you shouldn't be passive. Does that make sense? Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a tricky situation in the West where at times it seems like, hey, you're shunning Muslim or you're kind of quite possibly boycotting Muslim restaurants for doing something that you may be okay with non-Muslim restaurants doing because they're not Muslims. Yeah, because, you know, you, we hold our Muslim brothers and sisters to a higher standard. You know what I mean? Like, you know, in, in the same way that, you know, your, your brightest kid, you know, if, if they get a B, you know, they're going to be punished because they have, they have no excuse for not getting an A. So with Muslims, we hold them to a higher standard because they're, you're, you're Muslim. You have the Prophet as your role model. You have the Ahlul Bayt as your role model. If, if you're ignorant, you know, we're willing to kind of, you know, uh, help bring these issues to your attention but when it comes to uh when it comes to non-muslims again i mean they're they're not doing anything that's forbidden in, in their tradition so it's it's a bit it's a bit different but when it comes to when it comes to muslims there there's a higher expectation in fact allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that we are meant to be a witness over other nations that muslims are are naturally held to a higher uh higher standard uh, also uh, in verse uh, 119 when it's talking about as um, do we consider the meaning of that to be just referring to the Ahl bayt or do we consider it to also mean the truthful people in general does it have like does that meaning also considered now, now many of the Mufassirin they say that that it means it does have a general application but the the foremost among the truthful ones are the ahlul bayt now based on the ahadith that i read especially the one for the prophet it 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 seems like it's it's speaking about about the uh, the ahlul bayt the ma'sumin and if you want to stretch it, those who are following in their in their footsteps, because the prophet specifically in that narration says that when God says, "Oh, you who believe," that address is general. He's addressing the believers in general, not a specific group of believers, the mu'minin in general. Ya So those who believe is a very general term, and it encompasses the entire community. And be with the truthful. Now, the truthful ones is also a general label, but the Prophet says that it's it's referring to a specific group, and that is that the Imams of, uh, of Ahlul Bayt. So we have many. I mean, I, I was going through some of the ahadith. I'm not exaggerating if I say we have tens and tens of hadith where narration after narration people are asking imam al-baqir imam al-sadiq who's who's referred to by as sadiqin and they state unequivocally that it's the imams of ahlul bayt and none of those ahadith have make any mention of it's referring to to truthful people in general but it's also referring to the imams of ahlul bayt all of the imams seem to say without any reservation that it's referring to the uh, to the imams of ahlul bayt Meaning that that is the most important relationship that you know you sh you should worry about that relationship disintegrating 
as opposed to other relationships falling apart because of uh, because of nahi an al munkar. Thank you very much, Sheikh. This was a very yeah. thoughtful discussion. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. We have one more, and then uh, inshallah, we're on to the next uh, surah. Inshallah, looking forward to it.